I know I'm not the only one who has struggled to get my garden to actually produce. So today we are going to do seven of the common problems or mistakes that's causing your garden not to produce a good yield. We're going to start with number seven and work our way down to the number one reason. Number seven on our list is watering. <laughs> Under or over watering is definitely going to cause you problems with producing a good yield in the garden. For the longest time when I was a beginner gardener, I underwatered and my plants basically died without the water. <laughs> now I've kind of swung that pendulum all the way to the other side and now I'm kind of a little bit more on the overwatering side. Neither is good. <laughs> you really need to be watering your plants so that they get the optimal amount so that they don't die, wither away and die, but that they also don't drown and basically can't take in any oxygen or nutrients because all it has is water. So there is a delicate balance of making sure that you're not over or under watering. And my number one trick to figuring this out and the way that I even use today is to use a moisture meter. The moisture meter is this little device right here. And if I stick it a few inches into the ground, you're gonna see that little dial sits right in the middle, a couple, maybe one notch above dry. So this tells me that, you know, I should probably need to water this by tomorrow because I want it to stay in that little green region of moist not the blue region of wet and not the red region of dry. Say for example, I came out here and that moisture meter read that it was sitting on the high side of the moist level. I wouldn't water this. This tells me that these plants can go another few days and every day I will check it. I will put my moisture meter in just a couple of inches down, maybe two, three, four inches down and check to see how moist the soil is. And if it does show that it's sitting on the high side of moist, don't water. It doesn't even matter if, if it's your time of the week to water or if you always do it three times a week and so now it's three times a week. Don't pay attention to that. Pay attention to what the moisture meter says. If you don't wanna get one of these moisture meters, that's fine too. You can do the fingertip test, which is equally effective, but you have to, you have to kind of learn to trust what your fingertip is telling you. And so basically you're gonna put your finger into the soil down to about the second knuckle. And when you come up, as you can see here, my finger is kind of dirty and I can feel moisture. It's sticking, the, the soil is sticking to my finger. Even as I wipe it off, it's still sticking. That's because there's still some moisture in the soil. If it had come up, here, let me do this one here because I'm pretty sure this one isn't. Yeah. I did that soil, I stuck my finger in a soil bed where I know it's dry. And you can see that there's barely any dirt touching. And if I kind of wipe it away, it wipes away easily. That's because it is so dry, it's not sticky. I mean, this finger is still dirty <laughs> because that moisture sticks to your fingertip. So you can do the fingertip test and never, never water until you come up with a fingertip that is dry. Now, the reason why I like the moisture meter a little bit more than the fingertip test is the fingertip tells you I need to water now once it's completely dry, where the moisture meter is going to tell you when, you know, you're getting to that midpoint, whether you have another day or two, and that way you're not having to do an immediate action. Now, watering in the winter is going to be very different than watering in the summer. During the summer, the sun is so intense that even if it rained every single day, your soil might still get dry because the evaporation from the sun. Whereas in winter, I barely have watered these. I think this bed has not been watered in two weeks besides the rain, which keeps coming. And that's the only thing that has been watering it. But I know based on my moisture meter, I've got about one more day. So if it doesn't rain today, it's getting watered tomorrow. Number six on our list is going to be sun. All plants require some kind of sun. Some can handle a lot more shade and some need full, full sun. So the bed right beside me here is a full, full sun bed. And right out of camera view, that one right there is also a full, full sun bed. That means it's getting at least six to eight hours of Florida sun. 
every single day. By afternoon time, it does get a little bit of shade in the afternoon. But if you look over my shoulder, ooh, way down there, those beds on the end, it's already shaded and it's only noon. <laughs> so they only got morning sun, about three or four hours of sun. And that is it. That is all those beds in the back there get. So the only thing that I plant in those beds are, be are plants that really enjoy shade or can grow in shade. The easy way to kind of think about what plant can handle shade and which ones can't is green leafy vegetables typically can handle shade. They will grow a little bit slower, but they do, will do just fine in the shade. But fruiting plants and root crops, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, root crops like white potatoes, garlic, onions, they all like full, full sun. <laughs> so you cannot be growing those guys in a bed like that. There's also a really big difference between morning sun and afternoon sun. And the main difference between these two is that morning sun, the, the morning starts with, you know, the fact that it's been cool all night. It's been a nice light breeze. Maybe they got watered and they're starting to wake up and the coldness of the evening has not kind of gone away yet, but they're getting that nice intense sun. The afternoon, they've been baking all day <laughs> and the afternoon sun seems more intense because they've been sitting in the beds baking all day. If it had been like morning where, you know, it had cooled down and they had a break and then they had the intense sun, they would be fine. So we generally say that the afternoon sun is more intense, but in reality, the morning sun and the afternoon sun are equally intense. It's just what was the condition of the plant before it got hit with that sun? So that's one of the reasons why it's really important to try to focus on morning sun. Get them all of the sun they need before 2 p.m. So that, that way they get a little bit of reprieve with that shade in the afternoon and so they're not continuing to feel that intense, intense sun. Also, winter sun versus summer sun is very, very different. Winter sun is less intense. Um, we're a little bit, the way that the earth axis is, I'm not gonna get all into that because I'm not great with that science, but <laughs> the way the earth axis is and, and how intense the sun is, is a lot less during the winter. Whereas during the summer, you had a heat index and those numbers end up creeping higher and higher because we are closer to the sun based on the way that the earth is tilted. So because of that, summer typically is much more intense. The other thing that happens during winter versus summer is where is the sun in the sky? If you have a garden that is completely wide open with no places where there's shade, this probably is going to be the same regardless of whether it's winter or summer, other than the fact that summer has longer days and winter has shorter days. But where I live, there are trees up there, there's a fence right here, there's a house right there, there's a shed back there. There is everything that can cast shadows. And it also kind of casts more shadows because in the winter, the sun kind of skirts along the edge and during the summer, it comes straight up. So it gets more sun during the summer, not only because we have longer days, but also because it is directly hitting it from straight above. Whereas winter, it skirts along these trees right here, so it, there's quite a bit of shade. You can even see it right along here. At 12 noon, there's a significant amount of shade on the edges of my bed, on the south side of my yard. So make sure that you take into account what your winter sun looks like versus what your summer sun looks like. Number five is going to be spacing. <laughs> what we have right here is a row of cabbages. And I used to plant all of my plants very close together. Cause when they're young and they're like this big, you're like, why do they need so much space? It's because when they grow up and when they mature, they're gonna be this big. My bed right here is four feet uh, wide. And so basically with cabbage, cabbage should be at least, at least 12 inches apart. So I should be able to put four cabbages right in a row here. What I did was I did put four cabbages right in a row, but unfortunately this cabbage right here 
and this cabbage right here, I put a little bit too close. And those two right on the edge, this one and that one, actually have a bit more distance because these two were a little too close. Those are clearly growing much faster. They have heads forming as opposed to these guys that do not have heads forming yet because they are too close. Their roots are competing with each other and anytime plant roots come in contact with another plant's root, they start competing. And when they have to compete, they have to fight for the nutrients that are in the soil and it depletes the soil more quickly as well as slows the plants down because the plant isn't getting all of the room and area and nutrition that it needs in order to get big and full. Now these guys will definitely mature, but they are gonna mature at a much slower rate than those guys right there. The way I like to plant is using the square foot gardening method. Now I don't follow it perfectly because if you followed it perfectly, you would have uh, segments in your bed that were exactly one square feet and you would plant in the center of those segments. I do my own variation of square foot gardening, but I do stick with the concept of how many plants fit into one square foot. And that's a 12 inch by 12 inch spot. I find this to be highly, highly productive when you're growing in a raised bed or even in a container. Um, but if you are row gardening, you're going to do a more traditional approach, which is um, a standard row with a certain amount of plants in that row distanced from each other the same way that we would distance them in a square foot garden. So these cabbages need to be 12 inches apart in that row. But in between the rows, you're going to have a greater distance. It may be three to four feet before you start another row of cabbages. So that's kind of the difference between a square foot garden and a row garden is that the row has pathways in between them. Then of course you have container gardening. And I like to think of container gardening all in the aspect of a five gallon bucket. A five gallon bucket is basically one square foot. It's a little bit deeper than one square foot, but it is definitely wide and long as one square foot. So if you determine that you wanna grow a cabbage and you know that the cabbage needs 12 inches from the other cabbage, whether it says it on the packet or whether you research square foot gardening and know that one cabbage fits in a square foot, that means one cabbage fits in a five gallon bucket. Whereas something like onions, you can fit, I believe it's like six onions in a square foot. You could fit six onions in a five gallon bucket. If you're enjoying this style of video, make sure to give me a big thumbs up right below there. Let me know that you learned something new today or you just like this style of video. Number four as to why your crops may not be producing is because you're not using mulch. <laughs> For the longest time, I was a gardener that refused to use mulch because I just felt like it looked not pretty. <laughs> Mulch is so important for a healthy garden, and there's three reasons why. The first thing that mulch does really well is hold in moisture. So that way you don't have to water as often. And that's gonna help your plant be able to uptake that water better as well, because the more water that stays and hangs out is more water that's available to it. Another thing that it really does is it protects the ecosystem or the health of the soil life. So you don't get healthy plants without having healthy soil. And the way to keep your soil alive and healthy is to keep it moist. Because the little animals and the little bacteria and the mold and stuff that's happening underneath is all needing that water to be able to grow. And what mulch does is mulch protects the top layer. It's basically the skin for your garden or for your soil that keeps everything underneath it protected from the intense rays of heat from the sun, which can pretty much kill anything. If you can keep the soil healthy and alive and all of those worms and bugs and everything growing underneath the soil, your plants are going to be healthier for it. So that's why mulch is so important. And then the third reason why mulch is so important is mulch kind of brings down the level of pests <laughs> and it does it in a weird way. So mulch just 
provide an area for pests to hide, but it provides that area for the good pests as well as the bad pests. So it creates an environment where all the pests kind of want to hang out and then the good guys can come in and eat the bad guys. It's a great, nice, protected area where that can all happen. There's a lot of options out there for mulch. Um, I, I have certain favorites. These are not by far like the only ones that you can use. You can totally use lots of different materials. But my favorites is during the summer when it's really, really hot, I like to use grass clippings, but not grass with weeds in it true grass clippings and that's usually from my front yard which has the least amount of weeds. I like grass clippings because it kind of gets matted and thick and it lays on top of it and it really does a good job of holding water in during the summer here in Florida. <laughs> so you can imagine how well it would do in your garden. Now once we get out of that intense heat Grass can sometimes hold moisture a little too well, like we talked about in the first uh, segment on number seven with too much water. So I usually switch from grass to either dead leaves or like what I have in here, which is wood chips into my beds during the spring, winter, and fall seasons. Le dead leaves are especially great during the fall season because all of us have dead leaves that are dropping and all you have to do is rake them up for some free mulch. There's other options you can use like pine shavings or pine mulch or cedar mulch or pine needles. Um, I even use discarded plant material. So when I trim off my plants or I'm pruning my flowers, I will cut and deadhead those things off and just toss them right in a bed. And that is just another layer of mulch for that bed. The third reason why your garden may not be producing, and this is probably one of the bigger ones, is you're not fertilizing. <laughs> Here where I live, we get a significant amount of rain. And that rain washes away a lot of the nutrients that are already in the soil, whether that's bagged soil, compost that you create at home, or raised bed mixes that you've filled. All of that can get washed away with lots and lots of rain, which is what I deal with. So I have to add nutrients back to the soil in order to grow nice full crops. And the way that I like to do this is in two approaches. The first one is using something like this, which is garden tone. It's a granular fertilizer. It has a 344 NPK, that's nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. And it's a nice even split across. So what I do is I put that down around my plants once a month. The second way that I like to fertilize is these liquid fertilizers. And I have several here because I use them in different ways. So my number one favorite for green leafy vegetables is Alaska Fish Fertilizer because it is a 5-1-1 with nitrogen being that 5. And green leafy plants like lettuce and cabbage and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, they love nitrogen. So I will use this once a week when they're in their highest growing phase. So after the seedling stage and they're in the ground and they're really like growing through their growth spurt, I switch to using this once a week. Now, a fruiting plant like a tomato or a pepper, a cucumber, a squash, I'm gonna use one of these two guys right here. Um, tomato, th this, um, I think this Espa, yeah, Espamas, uh, they, they're the same makers of the garden tone back here, granular. They make a tomato liquid. I like this one for specifically for my tomatoes because it does have calcium and magnesium in it, which will help you avoid problems like blossom and rot. But other things, um, I will typically use the Neptune Harvest Tomato and Veggie, which is a 242. And the reason why I don't use this one on everything is because this one's more expensive. <laughs> now there are other things that you can add to the bed and I usually do this seasonally and that's gonna be amendments. That's things like your bone meal, blood meal, kelp meal, crab meal. There's also chicken manure, cow manure, horse manure, rabbit manure, all of those things. Compost, these are all different kinds of amendment that feeds the health of that soil. I normally add those at the beginning of my season. I do it two times a year. I do it at the beginning of spring 
in the beginning of fall. And I found that that has worked great. If I put down my amendments twice a year and then I put my granular fertilizer in the holes that I plant my transplants into, I usually don't have to revert to these guys until I'm in the final stages of um, maturity for the plant. And I, they only bring them in when I start to notice that my plants are growing slower or I have a lot of yellowing on the leaves. That tells me it's used up all of the nutrients in the soil and I need to add some back and I need to add it back quick. The liquid fertilizer becomes available to plants immediately, immediately. The granular fertilizer takes a few weeks because it needs the little microbes and, and animals inside the soil to eat it and digest it in order for it to become available for the plants. So that can take a little bit longer. Number two on our list is varieties. So behind me, I have a bunch of different kinds of greens and lettuces. And variety is going to be so important depending on your region. So especially in an area like where I am at, where it gets very hot, even in winter, <laughs> in about two or three days, we're going to be at 82 degrees during the day. And we are in the beginning of February, <laughs> 82 degrees. I know it's crazy. So it's really important that you pick varieties that you know can grow in your particular climate. So let's talk about one of the big things or misconceptions, heat tolerant versus slow bolt. They're not the same thing. I know they seem the same thing because down here where it gets very hot, things bolt or they go to seed and that's actually happening with this guy right here, he's starting to get a little bit taller than all the rest of them. That's because his stem is getting lengthier because he wants to flower. And that's because he has gotten too much heat lately. <laughs> now, there's other reasons why plants actually bolt and it's not always heat. People see this in Alaska a lot, for example, where they will have plants that bolt because of too long of sunlight. Maybe they don't get as hot as we do, but they have way more hours of sunlight than we do. And that will cause a plant to bolt. So when you see slow bolt, sometimes that means it's slow to bolt because of the daylight length. And sometimes it means it's slow to bolt because of its heat tolerance. So really what you should be looking for is heat tolerant, not necessarily slow bolt. Another really good thing to think about is where does this plant originate from? So right back here, this big leafy plant right here is a type of spinach. I have had zero, zero success with growing any kind of spinach like the Bloomingdale spinach or anything like that. But this is an Asian, an East Asian variety. I think it's a I think it's a Japanese variety of spinach. And that one actually grows here because it doesn't care about the wild swings in temperature because where it's from, it's used to that. <laughs> so finding varieties that are, you know, around your region, native to your area, or even in similar climates like Central South America or over in East Asia, those types of countries where they originate from, they are going to do a lot better in your garden than say something like a lettuce that is known to grow in Jersey. <laughs> Another trick that I like to employ is if I am just struggling to get success with a plant like spinach, for example, and I have tried all the different varieties, I have tried them from the right regions and I still just cannot seem to get a good harvest. I will move to hybrids. And that's actually what these plants are right here. These are Salanova from Johnny Seed, and these are a hybrid type of lettuce. I go to hybrids for my very, very hard to find or hard to grow plants. Lettuce isn't really hard to grow here, but getting it not to bolt with the swings in temperature has been a challenge for me. So moving to adding some hybrids in with my heirlooms means that I am getting the best of both worlds. I am still able to save seeds from these um, heirlooms and I'm growing, you know, some, this is a heat wave. It's a nice heirloom, great, you know, standard loves warmth. But then these Salanovas right here, they don't bolt. <laughs> they almost never bolt. I've had these go all the way into April and the leaves do get a bit bitter, but man, do they outpace 
any heirloom I've ever seen in terms of handling our heat, which is crazy. So if the heirlooms aren't working out for you, if the varieties from the right climate are still not working out for you, consider getting some heirlooms. It will definitely take some of the uh, stress out of varieties. Now, my favorite places to buy seeds from, there's three locally, and I really encourage you to get familiar with the ones that are growing seeds in your area because they are more adapted for your area. Down here in Florida where I am, the Urban Harvest with Elise, she's great. She's in St. Pete. There's Harris Garden, Harris Garden um, over in Orlando. And then flgardening.com, I believe he's in Tampa. I could be wrong about that. Correct me, he might be in Orlando as well. They are all in my area and they're all producing those seeds nearby. So I know that they're gonna work. Now, some other places that I like that are maybe not nearby, but do still cater to a Southern garden is going to be Baker's Creek, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, as well as Johnny Seed, which is a really great place to get those hybrids from. Now we made it to number one, the most important reason why your crops are not producing, and that is timing. When you plant your vegetables or when you plant your seedlings is incredibly important. It is probably the number one reason why some gardeners are not able to produce a crop is they're not starting them at the right time. And the right time is different for everyone. So if you're in a place like Northern Georgia or the very north points of Texas, you're gonna have a different starting time than say somebody who is in South Florida. So the way I like to think of this is in three segments. So the first one is areas that have zero frost, that during the winter you have no frost, zero and very hot summers, right? So South Texas, South California, South Florida. You guys don't typically get any kind of frost. You haven't gotten frost in years. And you have a very, very mild winter and a very hot summer. You are gonna start your cold weather crops starting around November through February. That's when you can start them. Um, you don't wanna start any later than February because by the time the plant is mature, it'll be way too hot and they may not produce, okay? So think about that. And you wanna start your warm weather plants, that's your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants, your squashes. Those start in September through March. <laughs> so they can handle being started a bit early and they can go a little bit longer into the heat because they're warm tolerant instead of like the cold tolerant types. But you notice there's an overlap, right? You grow your warm and your cold together through the winter, <laughs> which is crazy. The rest of the year, after March all the way to September, you are gonna be growing tropical varieties. That is really the only thing that's gonna grow during the dead heat of summer. Think of things like sweet potatoes, long beans, roselle, different kinds of tropical spinaches, tropical squashes like uh, seminal pumpkins, those kinds of things you're gonna be growing the rest of the year. Now, if you're in our second segment, which is you have light frost, that's actually where I live. I'm in central Florida. And there's a good portion of Florida that's like that. There's a good portion of Texas, good portion of Nevada, California, all of those states that have a, a climate similar to mine in that you don't really get a lot of frost, but you'll get a handful of them. This means that you have a gap. You have a gap in summer where stuff doesn't really wanna grow and you have a gap in winter where warm weather crops are going to die <laughs> because they cannot handle the frost, even a light frost, unless they're covered right? So you're going to be starting your crops, your cold weather crops in October through March. So kind of similar to South Florida, but a little bit earlier and it extends a little bit longer. So you can grow those cold ones then. For warm weather crops, so it's a little bit different. Instead of having a complete span like South Florida does, we have segments. We can start warm weathers in August and January. There's a gap in between. You can't go, you can't start them from August through January because at some point they're gonna be too big and they need to go out in a bed in the middle of winter and you're gonna get a frost and you're gonna kill them. So we have actual gaps. We have to start them in August 
so that they're ready to go out and sit in the garden sometime in October and get our crop before it freezes. And my freeze date is like the end of December. And then you start another round after about, you know, six to eight weeks before your last frost date. My last frost date is uh, February 15th. So I have frost that can happen from the end of December to February 15th. And so I start my tomatoes, for example, or peppers in January so that they can go out into the garden at the end of February. I hope that makes sense. Now, the third segment is people who regularly get frost or freezes. That's going to be your upper zones, your zone eights and sevens and, and above. You guys are going to be focused on your first and your last frost date as to determine when you need to start your plants. So you can go online. The Old Farmer's Al Almanac has it pretty well. You put your zip code in and they're going to tell you when your first frost, first expected frost date and last projected frost date is. And you're really going to be focused on that last projected frost date to figure out when you can start things. Typically on a seed packet, like for example, broccoli, I looked at a seed packet yesterday. It said to start eight weeks before your last frost. And that is because you can plant them out when it's still really cold out and the soil is still pretty cold. So you can plant them out and they should be able to hang on through one or two light frosts. But warm crops, it says something like start your tomatoes six to eight weeks, but don't plant them out until your last frost date has ended or passed and your soil is about 60 degrees. So there's a couple caveats there, right? You wanna start them early so that you can grow them up inside or in a covered area, but you don't put them out into the garden until that last projected frost date has passed. And then there's things that need to be direct sown, things like cucumbers and watermelon. Those, you have to wait until your last frost date leaves and in some cases like watermelons you might want to wait a few weeks after your last frost date because you want your soil temperatures to be warm enough to germinate and that's going to be around that 60 degree range and the last thing i wanted to say was i am going to be working on a ask me anything type series coming up so if you have questions about a certain plant about soil compost cooking baking preserving freeze drying me personally, <laughs> you want to know a little bit more about me and my garden and things like that, head down in the comments, leave me a question, and I'll be sure to include it in my Ask Me Anything series that I will be doing coming up very, very soon. It's been fun hanging out with you today. I hope this was helpful. Happy gardening, guys.